this is uh, so thank you thank you very much to uh, to Scala you for inviting me thank you very much to to, to fill the room um, and uh, I want to to give another special thanks to uh, the people behind uh, Scala JS because the slides are entirely done in Scala JS uh, this is what I'm talking about today is a, is a true story so it really happened in production and uh, this is uh, something I want to share with you uh, because it really helped us. Uh, for, for this presentation, uh, I want you to be interactive. Uh, if you want to express yourself, just do. Uh, the slides might be complicated uh, uh, at the end, so we'll take the time. You know, what we are to have a good time. And I want you to have a good time. So. Uh, if you have something to say, please do. Uh, if you wonder if the slides are online, there are. And enjoy, uh, enjoy the talk like you want. So feel free to do anything you want. Uh, we'll take the time to actually understand everything in, in it. So what's the context? Um, for, for two years, uh, I've worked in logistics. So what is logistics? Wh what you see here is, is a boat uh, that uh, have many containers in it. So logistics is transporting goods from one point to another. Um, so uh, so do we, we, what we were doing uh, was a recommendation system uh, for logistics. In this system, we have to find routes to say, OK, you, you want to transfer goods from that point to that point? Uh, we'll find many routes. Uh, so what we have, really, is something like this. So what you see is many routes that we want to go from A to Z. And there are many routes possible. So what you, what you see here, like A, P, and Z, are the, the stops uh, that we are going to take to ease the presentation I'll consider this is like just subway. So we have lines, like there is the one line, the fifth line, the four line, two line, etc. And if I want to go from A to Z, I can take the, the, the line one from A to P, and then the, like, the, the five from P to Z. So what we will call the leg is just uh, one travel by one line from one point to the other. Like here is a leg from A to B. Uh, the problem is uh, the, um, the transport uh, might be perturbed because at some stops uh, might have some accident and the, the speed might be lower, for example. So you don't know only to, to you don't want to know only the, um, the routes that you can take, but also uh, if there is some perturbations on the line. So, for example, uh, here, the, the I here uh, says, oh, there, there is a perturbation uh, in uh, the line one between A and P. Of course, if the accident is after uh, your stop, your arrival, or if it is before your departure, you don't mind because it's out of your leg. So what we want is we have all these many routes, and what we want to do is to find uh, which route uh, is pair tube on which leg? So we want to add the I that you see here. So our system already had uh, the routes possible. And the feature was, it was, it was a really good feature, uh, to say, OK, uh, on the routes, uh, we want to add an information. Uh, is it pair tube? So actually, it was more complex related to logistic and all. But to simplify, it's just, OK, there is a problem here. So what, we, what I will call a leg is just from one point to the other. Like I take the, the line one in the tram uh, from Charpen to Université Lyon, for example. Uh, what I call a perturbed leg is a, a leg that is perturbed. Uh, and a journey uh, is by you take several uh, steps. Like, for example, here from A to B and to B to C. Uh, is it OK for everyone? OK, fine. Mm -hmm. So. The domain. Um, the domain we have is, like I said, a leg. And a leg is a line, your departure, and your arrival. You don't generally take all the line. Uh, a journey is a list of legs, like just before, list of legs. 
And I just want to add a Boolean, uh, seeing if it is perturbed or not. Is uh, everyone okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. So what is the API we want? We have some legs. And what we want is basically to say, uh, is this leg perturbed? Th that's what we want. And that's actually the, the thing, the way when, when we started uh, speaking about the feature, we asked so the business, or, uh, can, you know, the user service, uh, do they have implemented it that way? That would have been very nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we add this function, what could we do? Because what we want is to add this information to every journey. So for every journey, so I take the list of journey, I apply a traverse, that's just like a map, which for IO, uh, and I add um, the information to every journey. On every journey, what I do is the journey is the list of legs, so I, ap I apply uh, the transformation just above to every leg, and for a leg, what I call is just up, uh, using this function. Okay, so this is what we have, and so what we want to do is to apply on every leg the function is leg perturbed. Uh, if it's false, then we don't show an eye. If it is true, we show an eye. Okay, great. The problem is <laughs> that's not what we have. <laughs> the API we really have uh, is uh, a API that looks like this. This is a batch API, and uh, we give to the function a list of lines, so not the leg, but the list of lines, and it returns the stops where there is a problem. So this is not actually what we wanted. We want a leg, we want just a boolean, so is this leg perturbed or not, and we have the, the problems on the line. But the question is, uh, am I concerned? I mean, there's a stop. Uh, if, okay, line one has a problem in E and G, G but, uh, Maybe I don't care because maybe I'm after J before E and between I don't know. So okay. Um, so what uh, what we what the situation we had is we have this very simple function that we want in the business code. This is the one we want, and we want the business code to be to be pleasant to read. Uh, ideally, we want it to be read by business people so they can validate and say, oh yeah, yeah, this is true. Uh, <coughs> But the problem is, uh, this is kind of slow because we have many requests to perform and uh, we can have several requests to perform several times. Like here, you can look that the, the leg P uh, to R from five is repeated. So we want to avoid repetition. We want to avoid making a multiple uh, request. And above all, uh, we want to use the, app, the only API that is provided for us we don't have the choice. <coughs> so the choice we had was uh, either uh, taking this one, this was the only solution possible, but either uh, doing all things with this or trying to be a bit more clever. Mm -hmm. um, the first tips, because there, there is 10 tips, the first tip is don't choose, mm -hmm. don't. No, take all the benefits and leave the drawbacks. Why would you want drawbacks anyway? Nobody wants drawbacks. But everybody wants benefits. So uh, what we can do? The idea is we want to offer the, the business code. This, this simple function, it's simple, it's easy to read, and everybody understands it because they understand what is a leg. Uh, so we want it to be uh, just like this for the, for the business logic. Uh, as you may have noticed, there is an auto batch. That's not IO, that's something that we created. Uh, of course, we want it to be renewable. So uh, at the end, we want an IO. But in the in the background, uh, what really will be in the back end, what we really want is the efficient batching API. So you see, we want something that does what is here. So this facade will collect all the calls to is leg perturbed. It will collect all the calls, then with all the calls, it will make one single call to the batch API. It will get a response. A response look like this, like this line is here. So, okay, th this is the lines you want to, to know the situation about. Uh, and here are the perturbation and the lines. Okay, what does auto batch is translating 
the response and replacing uh, every call to is like perturbed with the response. So it's auto magical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is it is it okay for you to, uh, to to do okay what we want to do? So we take in the business logic we write unitary calls. The magical auto batch API magically uh, collects all the all the unitary calls, make a single batch, and then dispatch the response. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the second tip is uh, write your own uh, abstractions. So why do you need to write your own? Because it fits your needs. And if you take someone else abstraction, it may not fit your needs. So you can just tailor one that fits exactly to, 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 to what you, you want, because it's yours, and you designed it so. So what do we want? Um, so we want uh, a type, of course, uh, auto batch, but I could have called it differently. Uh, and, but we want it to support this function. This is the function we want it to support. OK. Um, because having a monad is something that is desirable, we want it to be a monad. That's all. We want the unitary call, and we want to be able to write some code doing some map and flat maps and things we, we, we like. So this is what we want. This is not how we will do it. What we will do, actually, is building our own dedicated data type. So what do we want in the data type? So you can notice, here you have a sealed trait. Oh, it starts to look like an implementation. And actually, it is. Uh, we have this operation. OK, let's make a case class. I don't know. I mean, I have to collect all the unitary calls. I have to collect data, case class, data. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, and remember that we want a monad. So yeah, we can say, OK, this is things we need for a monad. Uh, as you may have noticed, if you, you know a bit how to encode a monad, yeah, it's kind of different from what you may see, because the idea is it, it's tailored to our needs. Because the, the, the fundamental idea is, is it has to do the job, and our job. Other people have different needs, so OK. Uh, so first, second tip is write your own abstractions, because abstraction is what you need in business code. Then for write your own implementation, because implementation is already how you perform your work. Be aware that an abstraction is not an implementation. What abstract means? It doesn't mean general. General is something totally different. A general means it works for many things. No, it abstract means that you removed every irrelevant details, every details that you just don't care. So you make it the simplest you can. And if you take the, the API there, uh, I just cannot remove this function because mm, that's the one we want. And uh, yeah, having a monad is also very nice because we need it. Uh, we actually need it. OK, so we kept the monad. Uh, so it, it, is, it is abstract in the sense that it has only what we need, nothing more. <coughs> um, your data type, this one, is not the abstraction. It's your implementation. And the rule is to never give access to the implementation because uh, you can have in your code uh, some invariants, some property. The, the, you, when you code, you do things right. But if you let everyone do everything with your code, you have no guarantee that the people will be uh, as cautious as you can be. Mm -hmm. So just lock the door. Um, so what you can do, actually, is provide a public API. So how can we provide a public API? Doing smart constructors, and that's tips number four. So what's a smart constructor? Uh, it's a constructor, and it is smart. No, really. Hmm? Um, so we have this case class. So it represents an app. Uh, we want to, we don't want people to access this thing. Because that's our implementation. We do something, like some tricks. We, we do, OK. For example, what we want is uh, if the first argument is a pure, well, the pure monad, and if the second is a pure also, hey, we could perform some optimizations. And so instead of just doing an app, 
we do a pure because we know we can do it. The thing is, it will perform optimizations, and that is nice. But so when I write my code, I say, okay, but everybody uh, um, uh, is making an app from this app. So you have the guarantee that I cannot have pure at both sides because this was eliminated by this. So it provides properties about your type. So you say, um, even your data types, you want to say, okay, but this, these arguments no, cannot be anything. So you make constructors that restrict unperformed things, like checking, like optimization, like everything you want. And uh, the gateway to your API will enforce these properties. Okay, <coughs> how does Autobatch really work? with lots of magic. And I'm sorry, but this talk is actually not about that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a long list of keywords, and maybe every one of these keywords worth a, a talk by itself. So we have Monad Transformer, because actually, yeah, it is. Okay? Uh, it's based on a generalized algebraic data type, and there is a nice workshop about it. Uh, it's a kind of free Monad, but not anyone. So it's not the one that you can find in libraries like uh, like ads. No, it's it's based on a free applicative uh, tailored to our needs. That is is like Peertube. So it's designed with love. Uh, so why did we make this? Because we wanted something. Uh, we wanted to uh, to collect as many calls, internal calls as possible. So one very important feature we had to have is to be able to collect unitary calls because if every batch call is only one unitary call, yeah, it's pointless. So some of the designs here rely on the fact that we want to maximize the collection and we want to maximize parallel collections and, and we want to perform some optimization. So it, it is complex, it is, but you can have a look at the code if you want. And we released to production. We were happy, we were very proud, because yeah, you, you, we used all of this. Hey, that, that's, we, we can be proud. Uh, and we shipped to production. Okay, that's the end of the talk, thank you very much. Uh, no, it, it, it didn't, it didn't uh, that was not what happened. No, actually not. Um, there were some timeouts. Okay. Mm. Uh, do you remember the optimization, some of the optimization I talked about? Uh, uh, some of them uh, actually did make us uh, save a few milliseconds at the cost of almost 100% CPU. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fortunately, our client uh, had an even worse API, so he, he just didn't notice. Um, so that was fine. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that always make sure that your optimization <laughs> don't waste time to perform a tiny optimization. So the the, the, the fire the fifth uh, tips is uh, you need to profile uh, on real data. We had tests. We actually benchmarked it uh, on small inputs. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the client had much bigger inputs that we thought. Yeah. <sighs> Fortunately, we've seen it before him. Okay. Um, so uh, this is, if, if you don't know what to use, uh, personally, I use Visual VM. Uh, it's available freely. And so what it shows is uh, you, you run your application, you, you, you run request, and so you can see where the time is spent. Okay. So we erase the timeout. And everything's working again. This is great. And what you see here is a remark by Edward Met. So obviously it's right. Uh, saying that um, this is for the review of functional programming in Scala. Very nice book, by the way. Um, where it says that monads have to be slow or unsafe. Yeah. Our, um, ours was not slow. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we had a, a very bad very bad moment uh, with the stack overflow. The problem is, uh, if you have some bugs in, in your feature, if your business is able to correlate the bugs with some data, they can avoid it, but how can you avoid the stack overflow? It just happens randomly. 
more than that, it's crashing the server. So you have someone doing a request. The request works, but someone else is performing the bad request that crashed the server. But the first person see the request not terminating and see an error. So, oh, my, my request sometimes is passing and sometimes there is an error. That's magical. So for the business, it, it starts to be magical that the big bad stack overflow and they, they spent lots of time, about what is it, what is it, where are they? how can we avoid it? it? It is like when we start from this location, I'm not really, and for this one, I'm not, it depends on what your colleagues do. <laughs> yeah, so that was magical. Uh, fortunately, we had a trick. And we start the complex slide. So I have uh, 30 minutes left and we will use all of this. The problem is, so this, this is like the factorial function where I replace the plus by the times by the plus to, to, to be more, more simple. Uh, is this function safe? We can think it is. I mean, on small input, it, it, it is. Like, like we call on this number, yeah, it works, fine. And on this one, you have your server crashing. How nice it is. So uh, we, we are Scala developers, uh, you, you have, we have done our classes, so we know that we have to do functions to be telrec. The problem is, this function is not telrec. An actual run function was not telrec either. Oh shit, what can we do? <coughs> do someone have an idea? Mm -hmm. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Some poor lines are slow, Kemet is right. <laughs> Sorry? Mm, yeah, that, that, that's the correct answer, but you have, but finding the accumulator may be difficult. So you have something that is called uh, CPS. This is a magical word that means continu um, continuation passing style. And the good thing is it transforms uh, most of your functions uh, into tail recursive functions. Uh, isn't that great? A magic, I told you. So, what's the idea? Um, we, we take the time to understand this slide. Uh, <coughs> the idea is, um, uh, if we call f here, so we will enter f, and then the function has to wait um, until uh, its result is given to multiply by n. So the problem is we cannot be telrec because we have to wait for n to terminate to do something more. Multiply by n. How can we do this? Uh, because if you want to be telrec, and uh, who knows here what telrec, well, who doesn't know what telrec is about? Great. So we want f to be the last thing we call, the last one. But how can we make f the last, calling f the last thing we do if we have to do something with the result of f? The answer is by telling f what to do. It's like do something, and when you're done, do something more. Mm -hmm. That's exactly that. So what you say here is fcps. So you take some int. That's the normal argument, the one you see above. And here is what you have to do with the result. Okay, so uh, for f of 100,000, what do we want? Uh, take the result as it is. So we give, no, just give the result as it is. Do nothing with the result, just give it. Um, when we have uh, to return a value, here we return one. What we do, we apply one to what we have to do after. And what we do after, after is k. So k means, what the hell we want to do after? So what is EFCPS? Is, uh, it wants to compute for an n, and when it's finished, it says, uh, I apply k on my result. That's exactly what it says. So if n equals 0, like above, uh, it wants to return 1. So it returns 1 to what it has to do with the one, so the k. Hey, cake, uh, um, actually, uh, I've told that you, are b you have someone who wants my result. Um, yeah, take it, it's yours. Okay, that's all. And if f, if f wants to call itself, so n minus one, which is the good result, 
uh, it says, okay, but what I want before calling k, so doing what I want to do with my result, actually my result is not r, it's n plus r, and r is the result of n. So uh, please uh, add n to the my result, and then continues. Is it okay for everyone? Okay, fine. And then we're very happy, very happy. Oh no, man, oh shit, what? Oh, we were happy, and actually we released a prediction, and it was okay, it was fine until. So, can you guess what's the problem? Yes, the function is telerake. All right, it's telerake. Speak aloud. Uh, you mean which one? Uh, this one? Uh, not really. Actually, what you have is uh, the, the function here to make it clear what happens um, is instead of just returning k1, uh, I make it k1 lazy just by doing a function that will compute k1. So instead of having the function fcps doing all the work, I split it into two things. Um, computing the final k, and then applying the final k. Computing the final k just works. But what we do actually here is, actually our function is still rake. It is really. But we are generating bigger and bigger and bigger functions. So the first function is identity. That's the first one. Then we use it to compose it into another function. And if you pass the argument uh, 100,000, you have 100,000 um, embedded functions calling themselves. Yeah. So our function is actually good. But the construction of k is like the composition of so many functions. Like, no, it's, it's a dead end. Uh, does someone have an idea for this? <laughs> Not yet. Some <laughs> are slow, actually, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's a technique that is called defunctionalization. It's simpler than it looks. So the idea is uh, if you are in a language where uh, you can blow the stack by calling functions, even if, if, if they are tel telerec, uh, what, what if you transform your functions into a data type? Okay, so you want this. So instead of having functions, you will have a data type. So let's have a look at the functions we have. So first we have uh, the functions k, that, that's the one blowing, you remember? Uh, FCPS is fine, that, that's the one. So uh, the one blowing is k. So what are the forms of k? So the first one is identity just there. And so here you use k for the function identity. The other time we create a new k is this one, the new k here. And we, com we, we compose it from the old k and n. So this is where you, we create the function k. And what we do is create a data type for it. So we give names to it. So what we will, we will call this function, r than r, we will call it id. Looks like a good name for it. Uh, and the next k, being very inspired, I call it next k. Mm -hmm. Because that's the next k, actually. Uh, and remember, there, there is some arguments. So the arguments k and the arguments n. So I give it some parameters. So no, instead of having functions, we have data. Okay? But you cannot call data. Mm -hmm. So you need something to evaluate your data on some inputs to simulate the function. <coughs> so you have an interpreter. What does the interpreter? The interpreter uh, just simulates the functions. So if we apply an R here on ID, remember, ID is this one. So it just gives the R. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and if you have next k, remember that next k is the second one. That's this one. So what we do when we interpret it, what we do exactly the body, but remember that we have here k applied. So of course, because no k is a data, we have to call the interpreter. And it is next k. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, the k, uh, call k on, so k of n plus r. And so the final function becomes this. Instead of having functions, you can see the difference. Here we have the functions, here we have the data. You have actually an, an object. The type is not int uh, towards int, but k. And uh, every time uh, we call the function, we call the interpreter instead. Is it clear? Yeah. Yes. So for the video, uh, what he's asking is, or what he's saying is uh, that we're moving the stack to the heap. And actually, yeah, this is exactly what it is. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely. Mm -hmm. uh, okay for everyone. So you replace your functions by your data. So you analyze. What your, what your function are, and you give an equivalent data type. So you just look at the arguments of the different functions. So uh, every uh, function creation would lead to a case, and the arguments are the arguments of the functions. Um, and you interpret like the function does. For example, on a, on a bigger example, if we take Fibonacci, here what we have, yeah, it becomes more and more complex. But this is the same situation. What we have is here uh, the first continuation, here, ID. The first one, and remember that here we are calling uh, Fibonacci two times. So we have the first continuation for this result. And we say the arguments are k and, and uh, n minus 2. Uh, and so the, 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 two, the, two continu the three continuations. Uh, and the first one, is calling the second one. Okay? And no, we're fine. Not yet. Uh, can you guess what's the problem here? Yes, actually, yes. Uh, we have two functions, and both of them are telric. That's great but they are calling each other. So this, Fib this Fibonacci, so the Fibonacci with CPS and definition, is calling the interpreter, and the interpreter is calling the function. And that's normal, because we have called Fib two times. Okay, the question is, uh, what does Telerik actually check? Uh, it check if the function is tail recursive, but only in, this, in its definition. So when you see uh, when uh, FibCD is calling itself uh, directly in, in its body, uh, it calls only here. There is a slide in the agenda talk uh, just addressing your point. Uh, so what's the idea? What can we do now? Yes, we can do a trampoline now. So what is a trampoline? Oh, sorry. Um, so the situation is this. Um, Scala is smart. So Scala can optimize self-recursion. And the bold word is self. So if you add this function, that obviously won't terminate. Uh, it won't terminate, of course, but it won't fail. It won't crash. It will just compute forever. And that's sometimes what we want for a server, for example. Um, so we want this function to, to run forever. OK. And it does exactly this. Uh, look now at these two functions. So g1 and g2. g1 is calling g2. And g2 is calling j1 on the same argument. And so they're looping. They should run forever. They're very similar to this one. Unfortunately, we have a stack overflow. Yeah. So what can we do about it? What we can do is using a trampoline. So what is a trampoline? 
That's exactly what it is here. So the idea is um, when you're calling G1, if you call G2 before terminating G1, then you, you will loop and you will consume the stack. That's a problem. So you need to call G2 after having uh, terminated G1. That's what we want. We want to the call to G2 to happen after G1 is finished. So actually what we're saying is do it later, because if it is do it now, it will blow the stack. So do it later. Once again, we create a data type. We always create a, create a data type. Uh, and actually, this, this one is completely useless. It just fits this example. So <laughs> what's the idea of, of do it later is uh, just some computation. Do it later. OK, do something. Uh, and so here we say, uh, do it later, uh, calling G2. OK. And for G2, it is do it later, calling G1. OK. Of course, uh, we have written a data type. We need to interpret it, to interpret the data type. Uh, and to run a computation, so you go one step and you loop. It just do it later. OK? This is OK for everyone. We have done most of the difficult part. <laughs> Almost all of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we apply all of, all of this to Fibonacci, this is what we get. Of course, this slide is difficult to understand. But this is the process. And when you, you are doing this technique, actually what you're doing is compiling by end. By the way, it would be awesome to have a compiler support for it. Um, <coughs> So this is only what we had here. We had the continuation type. That's the same as above. Uh, we have uh, FibCD. That's almost the same as above. And we have the, the interpreter. That's almost the same. The difference is we trampolined uh, the interpreter to say, oh, don't call FibCD because it will lead to a mutual recursion. Instead, do it later. And the FibCD here means uh, call FibCD later, please. Mm -hmm. And the result is, this is the result. Take it. So this is a jump line, completely unmade, just for need. Mm -hmm. uh, what does FibCD? Uh, on the second case, the else case, just it's the same as above, as before. Uh, and when it calls no the interpreter, so there is two possibilities. Either the interpreter just return a value by return, and this is the end of the computation. Fine, you have your value. Or the interpreter says, uh, I want to call you, but if I do, uh, the stack is going to explode. So I can't, I can't call you, but please call, call you yourself. Hmm? And that's exactly it. Uh, when when Fib uh, see that, that call K was about to calling FibCD, she so said, okay, you want to call me? Of course, <laughs> I call myself. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And so when you receive the order to, uh, to call FibCD, you call FibCD with actually the same argument. So look at uh, the interpreter. It's still recursive, and there is no mutual recursion. It returns a data type that is Trumpo for a Trumpo line, but I didn't have the, the width for that. Uh, and FibCD. No, doesn't expect the interpreter to return uh, an integer. Sorry. Uh, it expects to have a trample line, so it runs the trample line. And we've done almost all of it. We'll have many time for uh, a lot of time for the equations. Uh, but news is, uh, it's not always enough. The problem is, um, your function, the one that you want to optimize, might be trapped in inside the function that you, you don't have the control over. Uh, you can try to, to call uh, to call Zio or Cats effect people saying, ah, oh, you know, I have a need. Uh, can you fix? Ca can you uh, adapt some lib for me, uh, possibly in the day, please? <laughs> uh, it doesn't gonna work. Um, so when you have this kind of problem, here is Dalek M calling itself. Mm. Uh, the problem is we, we can't apply actually techniques because it's tr it's trapped inside the flat map. So the function that we will actually um, uh, call is flat map. 
And unless we tell the people, hey, can you adapt for that piece? And it doesn't, it doesn't going to work. So, of course, they are clever people. So, they found a solution. And the solution is uh, they trampolined the monad. So, what you have, uh, here I take the, the cats differ, but uh, every monad we love is trampolined. Because, okay, they figured out it was a problem otherwise. Uh, so, they are trampolined, and when you have a call, when you say, okay, uh, I, I'm just stuck, just look if the, the monad you're using, uh, or, the, or the applicative or the functor, what you want, uh, if it doesn't uh, apply the do it later, because differing is do it also later. So, this is a do it later that says, uh, if I do this now, uh, it, it's, it's going to fail. So, please do it later. And so, you can apply it into Telerik M to say, okay, do it later. This is a do it later. And it works. And so, we arrived, Loic, at the question you asked just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, about, yeah, but wha what Telerik is actually checking? What Telerik check is that you're not using your, um, your function in its body, but it's a syntactic, in syntactic feature. So, if the function you're calling are calling the function itself, it doesn't work. Uh, so, when you call differ, you remember Telerik M is calling itself. Okay. And just use differ for the case where you just cannot do something else. That's the point. If you want to be very fast, you have to, to, deal, to use uh, defer just later and to use your own data types to, to speed things up. Um, so, for the times where you have to use defer, and so you cannot be Telerik, uh, what you can do is give an alias for f. That's just an alias for f, an inline one. Mm -hmm. So, an alias for f, that's f in disguise, uh, and f in disguise of x equals f of x. But no, the function f is Telerik. Yes, because the only call to itself is here. Yeah, you tell me this is here too, but this is mutual recursion, but this is an inline, and uh, th this one is, an, is in the do it later, so it's fine. So actually, right, this call isn't safe. What makes it safe is the do it later. And because Scala doesn't know that there is do it later or differ, then we trick it. Uh, and the last, uh, the last tip is, so we have done ev everything we could, uh, how to be sure, completely sure, that our code is safe and that our code is fast. And uh, Scalac has a very nice feature, uh, no, very nice option. Uh, it generates the bytecode. So you just have to add uh, this, um, uh, this, uh, this flag to, uh, to, to the Scala options, uh, saying, uh, please, can you report the, the bytecode to, uh, to, to some directory? And then what you see here is, yeah, this is difficult to read, but bytecode is difficult to read, um, <coughs> is uh, the complete bytecode of your functions. So yeah, it's difficult, but what you can check is, you can check that you have go-tos. And you have also like the, the use of the frame. So you say, okay, here the frame is, okay, it's good. Uh, things you can check in the bytecode is, uh, is your call static instead of dynamic? Uh, do you perform go-to? instead of calling yourself, and a lot of things like this um, to ensure that it is, it is safe. So, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you will uh, use it in production um, uh, to have a fast and functional uh, stack safe code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, no question time. Mm -hmm. Uh, you said that there is a trap for when you interpret your monad and your flat map, and so that's we need to implement a Telerik M. And uh, what is that trap? Oh, yeah. When, when I say that, um, the the problem is um, okay. The, so to answer, okay, when you see material recursion or self recursion, uh, what we had to do is to rewrite a function. 
Um, that's the only thing we could do. The problem is um, in the slide, it's wrapped. Uh, this is um, here. What we would have to do is to rewrite flat map. So what we could do is either to do a peer on, on, on the, the people the implementing the monad, but I'm not sure they will ac accept it because <laughs> it's kind of related to our business, or, or it is to have your own uh, separate bunch, uh, which is cumbersome also. So the problem is the techniques we're using, we want, we want Telerik to be Telerik M to be Telerik. That's what we want. But, the f but we have to call flatmat before. So we're trapped. Okay. What if what ha what will happen if I don't implement this Telegram in or in a bad way? Uh, see, if you implement it that way, so what you have is Telerik M will call flatmap, and depending of the behavior of flatmap, flatmap by itself, but depending on the behavior, uh, you can lead to an error. And uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, there is a paper by uh, the, one, the guy doing a uh, pure script, and it has been done in CATS because Telerikam is actually in CATS. So there is a lot of documentation. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you see any impact on the memory in production with that because of the trumper lining and stuff? No, it, it works no. most of it. Th this is um, doing CPS and uh, construction, uh, it's mostly safe. We haven't seen problems. Uh, no, actually, no more memory conceptions. Uh, it can have more, uh, actually. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how the, the GVM really optimizes. Um, if you design your own data types, then you might open some space for optimizations, and maybe, I don't know if someone is uh, listening and uh, knows that, uh, I don't know if the um, GVM perform escape analysis. So the objects might still be in the stack. So they might still be, but I don't know. But actually, it's, uh, it's, it's mostly safe uh, here, because uh, what you can do either is um, just uh, augment the um, the size of your stack, but this is this is not this is mostly because of sl uh, slowing the computation than using more memory. You have a lot of heap, so it's okay. But but you, you will technically slow things. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.